Okay. Yeah. Let's um let's begin in Luke chapter four. <clears throat> in verse <clears throat> sixteen. Well, hold on. Let me, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, let me start in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Um, forgive me. Let's start in Luke chapter 3. And let's start in verse 21. Um, now, when all the people were baptized, um, so so John was baptizing. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because even before this, so John is baptizing these people, and, and so then they came to John, and they were asking John the Baptist if he were the Christ. And he said, not even close. He said, I, I'm not even worthy that I should tie his his shoes of the one that's coming, who is the Christ. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and with fire. And then not long after, it says in verse 21, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, and of course we know from the other accounts, Matthew and so forth, that John was the one that was baptizing Jesus. And so as he was being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. Of course, you know, that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is a bird. We, we know that. But I do think it's interesting here that it says, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape. Why? It 
is the Holy Spirit is a person just the same as Jesus is, just the same as God the Father is. Now, what did that bodily form look like? I mean, that, you know, I don't know. But isn't that an amazing picture? Jesus is baptized. And then it says, and the heavens open. Now that alone, can you imagine what that must have looked like? You look up and the heavens are open. I don't know what that looked like. You know, to me, you think about the Lord, you think of his glory, you just think of light. But the heavens open. And then here, in a bodily form, the Holy Spirit, and he rests on Jesus. Now, I think that this is my personal interpretation, because we understand the Holy Spirit is not a bird. Um, that 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 would be more like, um, you know, that that would be more like what all of those, you know, Egyptians and all of these other countries outside of Israel would worship. I mean, they would worship the craziest stuff, man. They would they would make statues and they'd turn them into a god. You know, they would, you know, they would they would worship stuff like a bird, right? I mean, when Moses went up and he was taken so long because he spent 40 days on the mountain with the Lord, not eating or drinking anything. They made a god shaped like a cat baby cow and they were worshiping i mean that's crazy so we know you know that the spirit of god is not a bird but i believe that god used that representation of a bird because of just how how gently he rested on Jesus. You know, if you were to have a bird come and sit right on your shoulder right here. I bet you would really ba barely even know that it was there. I mean, birds don't weigh a whole lot. And they're very kind of just kind of gently resting there. You know, by the way, speak, okay, Th this is a random insertion here, but it, um, I just saw this for the first time the other day, maybe a week or something ago. You know, I mentioned Moses. <clears throat> when he went up on the mountain, okay, and I mean, that's when he stepped in you know, to the cloud with the Lord. So he was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says that he didn't eat or drink during that time. Now, that's, that's crazy. Okay. Now, Here's what's interesting. I, I never thought of this before. And maybe this is nothing. Maybe this means absolutely nothing. I just thought it was, I found it interesting once I saw the correlation. But so Moses did that. And then you read on later on where Elijah did the exact same thing. And he didn't eat 
for 40 days and 40 nights or drink. Okay. Well, then where we kind of just picked up this um, here in Luke, um, or where we're about to get to, I guess we didn't get to this point yet, but in Luke 4, the early part of chapter 4, well, then that's where Jesus is in the wilderness, and then he didn't eat for 40 days. Now, there could have been others, and I may be wrong on this, but I, I don't I don't recall anybody else. But from what I what I can recall, the only three in the Bible that did that were Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Well, when Jesus took Peter, James, and John, they went up and he was transfigured before them. Who were the two that showed up? Moses and Elijah. I mean, I doubt maybe that has nothing, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. I don't know, but that struck me. I thought, whoa. And by the way, you know, you, you think about that. I've thought about this many times. Why would I just have? But here's Jesus. Son of God. And I mean, God could have sent anybody. He could have sent anybody there to meet with Jesus on that mountain. But he picked Moses and Elijah. So that gives you some insight into where they stand with God, you know? I mean, I don't know, to me, it's like just the reality of that, of here's how important these, these two were to God. Anyways, um, it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but oh, I just found that really interesting. Okay, so where were we? Um, we were reading. What were we reading? Oh, okay. So the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon Jesus. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Now, I never thought about this. I was listening, I've been listening to some Catherine Coleman uh, lately, just that night as I'm falling asleep. Stacy and I, we kind of just laid in my phone in the bed there and, and listen while we go to sleep. And she was talking about this. And I never thought about that before, but she said, here, in one place, at the same time, you have all three. You have God the Father. You have Jesus. And you have the Holy Spirit resting on Jesus. I, I never, I just had never thought of it like that. I just thought how cool that was. All three of them together at one time in the same place. Oh, wow. So, anyways, so then it goes through the genealogy, <clears throat> and then we get to Luke chapter 4, and it says, and Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit 
into the wilderness. So now here he's been baptized. The Holy Spirit is with him. The Holy Spirit is leading him. Now remember, when we say the Holy Spirit, I mean, who is the Holy Spirit? He, he is the Spirit of God. You know, it's weird to think about, in a way. But God and Jesus are both in heaven right now. Yet, the Spirit of God is here with us. Great. Now, he, he, uh, the Holy Spirit, he's really, the way that I see it, he's really the Spirit of Jesus and the Spirit of the Father in one. Right? Because listen, the, the, the three... We know that. Yeah, there's Father, there's Son, there's Holy Spirit, but yet all three, they're one. So now he's full of the Holy Spirit and he's immediately being led by the Spirit. So he's led into the wilderness and then he was tempted 40 days of the devil. And then it goes through that. And then in verse uh, 14, it says, and Jesus returned in the power, or you could say in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Well, it just says of the Spirit. Okay. Now we'll pick up in verse 16. And so he came to Nazareth. where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And there was delivered him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, He found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord See, he calls him the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book gave it again to the minister, and he sat down. And as he sat down, he said to all of them, as everybody was looking at him, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, they didn't take too kindly to that because that was... Well, blasphemous the way that they saw it. Okay, now let's go to Second Kings. And um, 
you know, this is interesting because you know, as we were just talking about Elijah, you know, and how close he was with God, um, how much God used him, talked with him, trusted him, um, the different things that Moses, I mean, that Elijah did, you know. I mean, I just read it whenever, within the last week or something probably, when he challenged those 450 prophets of Baal. You know, but, <clears throat> which, I, you know, I suppose you could look at it from the outside and we would look at that and say, man, this guy's crazy. He's taken on 450 prophets. He's challenging them. Now, of course, he's challenging, you know, prophets of the devil. So we, we get, we get, he's, you know, he's on the winning side of this thing. So we understand that, but we get the way that he goes about it. He says, all right, go ahead, build up your altar, have your, have your shot, you know, and they go all morning and until noon and, I don't know, he's, and he's laughing at him. He's making fun of them. You know, um, he's, he's just straight mocking them to their face. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, your God, he must be sleeping. You've got to wake him up. He must be asleep. Maybe you need to wake him up so he'll bring down the fire. I mean, he was just ripping on him. And then, so then it comes his, and I mean, he just douses the thing with water. You know, and I mean, I think he poured water, I believe it's three times. I mean, to the point where, you know, they put that trench around it. I mean, the whole trench, I mean, it's just soaked in water. And then he prays and boom, that thing just goes up. But, but, here, but here's the thing, man. You know, I, I was thinking about that. I was just thinking about my own life. And, and I'm, I have no doubt you guys have experienced the same thing. But there's, like, you look at it and, you know, you'll pray or you'll trust the Lord for something. And in the moment, it just sort of seems like no big deal. You're just trusting the Lord, man. You're you're just you're walking with Him. Whatever it is that you need to happen, you you pray, bang, the thing just happens. And I mean, you know, I'm talking about like stuff that is so out of the ordinary, just the miraculous stuff. That the stuff that you know, it's like, whoa, that that should not have happened. How, there's no way to explain how that happened. If you're looking at it from the outside, you would think that's absolutely insane. You, you can't expect that to happen. That's crazy. That will never happen. But yet when you're walking through it, because of the closeness with God that we're walking in, it seems like, it just seems like nothing. It just seems like no big deal. It just seems like you pray and it just happens. And it's like, yeah, of course it happened. Of, of course that just happened. But that, that, but that, that's that confidence. It's that confidence that, that, that the Holy Spirit gives us because, of course, he knows it's going to happen. You know, and he brings us in to this place of faith Um, you know, 2 Corinthians 4.13 talks about the spirit of faith. And that's that's what that is, you know. He, he empowers us with such a confidence that in the moment, it, it, it doesn't matter how big the situation might look, how crazy It just, it's like, yeah, of course that's going to happen. 
And then it happens, you're like, well, yeah, of course it happens. And that's not taking for granted or taking lightly what God is doing or has done, right? Because we're, we're still thankful nonetheless. But yet there's just this confidence that's so strong. Because of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. But in any case, the reason why I was bringing up Elijah and all the, th the things that he had done was because when he was about to go to heaven, and that's how close he was with the Lord. And by the way, it just as a reminder, I know sometimes people, you know, when we talk about the Old Testament, some people think, well, that's Old Testament, and they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, they, they weren't born again like we are. We, we understand that. Holy Spirit living inside of us. <laughs> but how else? How else could they ever have possibly done the things that they did if they did not have the Holy Spirit? God is in heaven. Jesus is in heaven. What are they getting empowered with? What was Moses empowered with when he split the sea? Or when he hit the rock and water comes out? Right? The same thing with Elijah. But here's what's interesting. So Elijah, see, he's so close with God. that he even knows, hey, I'm about to go to heaven, and I'm not dying here. I'm just going. The Lord's sending a chariot, <laughs> and he's coming to get me. And so, Elisha, so, of course, Elisha knew that. And so Elisha says to him, now listen, would you, hey, you know, because he's trying to tell, Elijah's trying to tell him, now listen, you just wait over here. I'm going to go do my thing. The Lord's taking me. He's like, I, I'm not leaving you. <laughs> no, sir. Wherever you're going, I'm going. You know, See, he knew what Elijah carried. So three different times, Elijah tries to get him to just no. He said, "No, I'm not leaving your side." And then Elijah said, "Okay, now listen. I'm about to go. Well, what would you have me do for you?" And so Elijah's response is, "Well, here, let's look. It's Second uh, Kings." Chapter 9, I'm sorry, verse 9. Um, and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from you. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so unto you. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and part of them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Verse 13, and he took up he took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he smote the waters and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither because Elijah did the same thing when they came across to get there. So now he's crossing back over. So he said, well, hey, this is what Elijah did. I just, I just received his mantle, Lord. I just asked for a double portion of his spirit. Said, Lord, I'm looking for you now. Where are you, Lord? Are you here? Let's see. Are you here? Boom. And those waters split. And when the sons of the prophet 
uh, the sons of the prophets, which were like those prophets that were in training, that were learning from Elijah, um, just like Elisha was. When they came to Jericho and they saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And you know what's interesting, too, because I never thought of this until right now, but I mean, of course, I thought it was amazing how he goes up and then it's a chariot of fire and it's horses of fire. Let me let me see if I can find this real quick because um, yeah. Well, now look at this. Okay. So now, so again, just think about what we're talking about here. The spirit of the anointing that was on Elijah. Elisha asked, hey, I want a double portion. Now that's wild. I mean, the anointing, the anointing alone that was on Elijah was wild. And here Elisha says, yeah, I want double of that. Well, now here, a few chapters later, when you get into 2 Kings chapter 6, Now, this is where um, Elisha, he's hearing the king of Syria. He's hearing what his plans are in the spirit, and then he's communicating that. And so now they're coming after him. And so in verse 13, well, we can read verse 12, because this is where the king um, of Syria is, is finding, well, how, how is the king of Israel? How, how, how does he know my ever move? Who's telling him our secrets? Well, and they said, well, one of his servants said, nobody of us, Lord. But it's Elisha, the prophet that's in Israel. He tells the king of Israel the words that you are speaking in your bedchamber. And he said, go and figure out where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told, he's in Dothan. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army. And they came by night. And they compassed the city. I mean, they, they surrounded him. They surrounded the city where he was. And the servant said unto him, alas, my master. Now, this is Gehazi. Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered him, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray that you would open his eyes that he may see. Now look at this. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw and behold the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Think about that. Horses and chariots of fire came to get Elijah and took him up in the whirlwind. And now here, when Elisha needs help, who shows up but those horses and chariots of fire? I'm saying, look at what the anointing of God will do. Look at what the Spirit of God will cause to happen for you. The same chariots and horses. Wow. All right. Um, What was I thinking? Well, I guess we were saying that hey, he 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 received 
that same spirit and anointing that was on Elijah came upon Elisha as well. So a couple of things I just want to share with you about the anointing. Um, well, here, I'll show you one thing right here in 2 Kings. Let me just, we can just look at this really quick. I, I won't go through the... Um, The exact story. I mean, the story itself is in um, in Second Kings chapter four, but um, that's where Elijah uh, raised the the son of the woman, um, the life that that she had built. You know that nice little. I don't know if it was little, but she had built this room for him. He would pass by and she'd feed him. And then she's like, well, I've, this guy's a real man of God. I think we got to build him a place for him to come and sleep and rest. And, and so, you know, he asked her for doing that for him. He said, okay, what, what can I do for you? What would you like? And so she, you know, just, you know, past the years of child, childbearing, but they asked for a child. So of course he got they got a child, but then that child died. And so Elisha came, he laid on him, brought him, laid him on his bed, laid over him and brought him back to life. <clears throat> Second Kings 8 says, And Elisha spoke to the woman whose son he had restored to life. Restored to life. See, the anointing will restore to life what is dead. Remember, God is life. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. I mean, he is the spirit of life. So when the anointing of the Holy Spirit touches anything that's dead, it immediately comes back to life. It has no choice. All right. Um, let's look at Deuter Deuteronomy. Chapter 8. Verse 18. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. So we have the anointing, it will restore back to life what's dead. The anointing will also empower you to get wealth. See, it's it's an anointing for wealth and anointing for prosperity. I believe I mentioned this last week, but the Bible said about David that from the moment that he was anointed, he behaved wisely in everything that he did. Well, when you act wisely in everything that you do, you are going to succeed you are going to prosper. You are going to increase and gain wealth. It, it, you can't help it. You, man, that anointing will cause you to create wealth without even 
realizing it. You know, because with, with God, man, that, that's the thing. Like we were talking about earlier, how when that anointing is on you and that the spirit of God is so strong with you, you will you will pray and and you will trust God for things, and it'll seem so effortless. So so effortless, but as if like we can, there's no other option but for what we need to happen. There's no other way. We know there's no question about it. There's no doubt. And, and that's what happens when that anointing to create wealth comes on you. you you'll, you'll have money coming in from unexpected places and you won't even know how. Because it's not you, it's the anointing. The Bible says, in Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And he adds no sorrow, no toil with it, no stress, no struggle, no pressure. See, it's the anointing, it's the blessing that does it, not us. And that's what he was telling them in Deuteronomy. He said, listen, now, don't you forget the Lord your God. When you've built all these houses and you have all this gold and all this silver and all this food stored up and you're prospering greatly and you have all this wealth, don't forget the Lord and say, well, I created this. I got this wealth. Don't you forget it was the Lord who gave you the power, the anointing, to create that wealth. Okay. Psalm 89. Verse... Uh, let's see. Oh, what's the verse on the block? I didn't write it down, did I? Okay. Wait, did I write it down? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's start in verse 19. Then you speak in vision to your Holy One and said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one out of the, one chosen out of the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. See that oil, that anointing oil is holy. You know, I, t I told you guys already about what happened with, with Elena. You know, she both her and the, I don't know where this came from, but they both. And, and there's a lot kind of similar. Elena was on the right side. Noah's is on the left side and kind of up around his shoulder and on the arms a little bit. But these, these, I'm like, what are these, these bumps all over? Well, we started anointing Elena with oil, praying for her. I mean, hers went away within a few days no more than five, six days, a week at the most. And they were, I mean, to the point where her skin was totally smooth. Now Noah's, his, is, his have been taking longer. I don't know why, but they are but they are getting a lot, lot better. And we, and I'll be honest, we hadn't been praying and anointing him quite as consistently. So probably part of that is on us, you know, to be honest. Um, but, I've been doing it and trying to be more diligent about it. And his are getting a lot, a lot of his now are already smooth. Now. He still has quite a bit to go, but his have really gotten a lot better. And I'm, I'm just telling you, man, that anointing oil is holy. That oil is holy to God. 
I'm telling you. I heard David Oyedipo say this. He's got the largest church in the world. He said, the, the anointing oil is such a wonderful mystery because he said, here you have an this bottle of anointing oil and it, it, it is the Holy Spirit in a bottle. And the Lord told me, because what I've been doing, I've been praying and anointing Stacy and the kids. You know, I'd anoint them, pray. And the Lord said to me, maybe I told you guys, sorry, I don't, I don't remember, but he said to me, he said, Kyle, he said, in relation to the kids, he said, he said, every time you're anointing them, you're putting me upon them. Whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, that that rocked my world. He said, you're putting me upon them, Kyle. Yeah. That's how powerful that anointing oil is. So I encourage you guys. Yeah, you can get, I mean, I found, you can even get it on Amazon. The stuff that we got at Bill Winston's church, I found the same, that same company, they sell it on Amazon. Okay, so I have found my servant, David, and with my holy oil, I have anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, and my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes or his enemies before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. See, the, the anointing will cause your enemies to be defeated, will cause your enemies to flee. I told Stacey that last night, we were out and she was having a rough time. And I told her, I said, first thing you do, you get the anointing oil, you anoint yourself with oil and you pray, you know, because that anoint, that, that anointing oil is powerful. The anointing is strong. It will break the yoke of bondage. The anointing will cause your enemies to be defeated. It'll cause your enemies to flee. All right. Um, so the anointing will destroy your enemies. Ah, Isaiah 58, 14. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So I wrote, um, uh, what did I say here? The, so the anointing will carry you to new heights without struggle the anointing will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth okay uh, a few more here um okay acts 1 8 you know i've talked about some of these before but good to revisit these get these Continue to meditate on these. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power or ability, the ability of God after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. See, the anointing brings 
the ability of God. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's for real. Okay, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. See, the anointing will strengthen you. The, the anointing will cause you to be able to continue to press forward and not grow weary and, 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 and not become exhausted and not become drained and tired and faint along the way. Now, that, now that's, that's a, and that's a good thing to mention here because look, when, when, I guess I'm just saying place there. When we see that can be a good indicator here. Okay, we start getting exhausted, we start getting worn down, we start feeling drained. That's a good indicator. Wait a minute now. Who am I trusting in here? Because if I'm trusting the Lord, his anointing is going to be upon me. But if I'm starting to get drained and I'm starting to feel exhausted. Now, not always doesn't this, but not always is this the case. But it could mean, man, maybe we've kind of stepped out and started to maybe trust in the flesh. You know, we're trusting our own strength or trust in what we think is right instead of truly staying yielded to the Lord and letting His Spirit and His anointing lead us and guide us and empower us to do what we need to do. Okay, let me look at this one. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 9. Okay. Uh, let's start in verse 7. Go your way. Eat your bread with joy. And drink your wine with a merry heart, for God now accepts your works. Let your garments be always white. And let your head lack no ointment or no anointing, no ointment or anointing. I don't know if I really had anything in particular. I just thought that was really cool. <laughs> you said, let your head lack no ointment. Let your head lack no anointing. See, the, the, we don't ever have to go through those times of being exhausted or being drained or being without the anointing of God. He said, let your head lack no anointing. So we should never lack for the anointing of God. You see, he said, I am always with you, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he's always there. The anointing is always there. Question is, are we yielding to him? Are we yielding to his anointing? Okay. Let me read this one. First Samuel. Now this one I saw, I was watching uh, Benny Hinn, and he was 
he did a teaching on the anointing a few weeks back and he talked about this one. I thought, wow, this is really good. First uh, Samuel 13. Oops, that's second Samuel. I'm probably kind of rushing. I'm just trying to get through these, but I'll, I may just <clears throat> have to go a few minutes over here. Not, not too long. I just want to share these with you guys. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, 13 verse 9. Well, let's just start in verse 8. <clears throat> and he tarried seven days. This is talking about Saul. Um, he tarried seven days. According to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, bring here a burnt offering for me, to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him. Now he had told him, don't do this, don't. So uh, verse 11, and Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you came not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, I said, well, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and have not made supplication to the Lord. Look at this. I forced myself, therefore. Ooh, buddy. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now, would the Lord have established your kingdom upon Israel forever? But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be kept in over his people, because you have not kept that which the Lord commanded. Of course, he was talking about David, you know. But here's what, but here's what um here's what Benny Hinn said. He said, you know, here where he says, I forced myself, therefore. He said, if you have to force it, God is not in it. If you have to force it, God is not in it. He said, whatever is forced needs to die. Anything that, that you need to push to make it happen, it needs to die. Because he said, when God is in it, man. You don't have to push. When, when, when the anointing is working, you, you don't have to push. You don't have to force. So I really, I really enjoyed that. And then he, oh, and then he talked about one more here too. Well, he gave actually two more, two more scriptures that he mentioned that I wanted to share with you guys. Second Chronicles. Chapter 26. And I think it's verse 18. Well, let's 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 just start in verse 16 and then read into 18. Now this is talking about Uzziah. And he said, But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. To his own destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, It appertains not unto you, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. 
go out of the go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Neither shall it be for your honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth, he was angry, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper until the day of his death. And so here's what here's what he said. He said, he said, whenever you do what God has not anointed you for, it is trouble. If he was not anointed to do that. It was only for the priests, the sons of Aaron that were consecrated or sanctified, anointed to do that. So he said, whatever you do, I'm sorry, he said, whenever you do what God has not anointed you for, it is trouble. So he said, find what you are anointed to do. Remember, we started the, the message with Jesus saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. And then he listed the things that he was anointed to do. And that's one of the things, now, one of the many, 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 many things that made Jesus' ministry in that short, short time so powerful. He knew exactly what his purpose was. He knew exactly what he was anointed to do. And he followed that. He did not stray from it. He did not try to do more than he was anointed to try to do other things than he was anointed for. He just stayed right locked in, led by the Spirit of God for what he was anointed to do. He knew and he talked, he, he, he confessed and declared all the time what he was there to do. Okay, that's a good place to end right there. I mean, we ended it where we started. With the anointing that's on Jesus. Oh, okay. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And we thank you for your anointing. We thank you for the power of your anointing. We thank you for what your anointing empowers us to do. The peace, the security of walking with your spirit. Staying in the place where we are anointed and what we are anointed to do. Father, we ask you to help us to continue to grow in the anointing with which you have called us, the anointings that you have placed upon our lives. We ask you to help us to yield to you and to your anointing in an even greater way. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.